Although I am someone who's been falling down the gust hole for the past year and a half, strangely enough, I had never tried Knights of Azure. As I was diving deeper into the Atelier series, Knights of Azure always felt like the weird cousin who dresses like a scene kid and doesn't talk much at family gatherings. But after a long time of glancing at the game every now and then, I decided to buy not only the first game, but its sequel as well. Was it an impulsive 4am PSN sale purchase? Yes. And no. I've been curious about these two games as I've been meaning to branch out and cover more Gust titles for quite some time now. Let's start off with some general information before we get into things. Knights of Azure is a 2015 JRPG produced by Keisuke Kikuchi and developed by Gust. Many centuries ago, the world was attacked by a being known as the Night Lord, who cloaked the world in eternal night. Eventually, a knight came along that defeated the Night Lord, but his essence was spread across the world in the form of the Blue Blood, which rained down after his defeat. This led to an outbreak of fiendish demons as a result of beings coming in contact with the Blue Blood. Cut to the present, where we have our half-human, half-demon protagonist named Arnis. Ar... Ar... Nice? Um... Ar... Um, I'm going to be referring to her as Ari, for simplicity's sake. She is a holy knight who is affiliated with an organization known as the Curia, who are working to stop the Eternal Knight. By her side, she's got her close friend Lilise, who I'm going to be referring to as Lily, for short. Lily is a saint who is chosen by the Curia to be the one to seal away the Night Lord at the cost of her own life. The full moon starts to peek around the corner, signaling that the sealing ritual is approaching. And although Lily is determined to fulfill her role as the saint so that the world can be safe, Ari is desperate to find another solution to save her and defeat the Night Lord. And so, a race against the clock begins. This premise is very interesting and appealing to me, personally. Just outside of the fact that demons and holy knights are very cool in pretty much any game, the theme of debating whether or not to turn against the world for love is very powerful, and seeing the girls proclaim just how much they care for each other on multiple occasions is incredibly sweet and also horribly sad. <laughs> There's even some turmoil to be had surrounding the truth of their relationship and whether they were just pushed together as a knight and a saint by the Curia and nothing else. And this story of love shows how hard it can be to be honest about your feelings, especially when your partner is scheduled to be sacrificed once the full moon hits. Do you just stay quiet as to not make it any more painful or should you be honest once the final moment hits? At its core, it's a rather traditional JRPG. You travel to different locations around an island, fight some enemies as you clear your way through the different areas, eventually come across a boss, learn some more about the world and its characters, etc, etc. The combat isn't super polished by any means, but by god is it stupid fun! <laughs> you have your normal attack, heavy attack, and special attack tied to the square, triangle, and X button respectively, with a dodge roll being tied to circle and L1 allowing for swift movement. One of the more unique parts of the combat in Knights of Azure comes from your servants. You can summon little helper demons, known as servants, to fight alongside you and even command them to execute a unique special skill such as large AoE attacks, shields, and even healing you. As you go, you'll not only be able to unlock more of them, but you can also power them up, which leads to different gameplay options depending on what kind of build that you want to go for. You also have your devil trig- <coughs> Um, sorry? <laughs> Demon form, which powers up both you and your servants. I was pleasantly surprised by the amount of combat options in the game, as I wasn't expecting much of a depth at all. Again, it's not the most polished, as it can sometimes feel a bit unresponsive, and it doesn't really punish you for doing much but button mash as long as your SP bar is up. But there's definitely potential. I am a really big fan of the aesthetic of the game. I love the character designs and the art done by Yoshiku. The gothic feel that it has really sets it apart, and it gives it a sense of individuality that doesn't exist in many other Gust games. The animation leaves something to be desired, but the slight jankiness is also something that I've come to find a bit charming at this point. Although a majority of the game takes place on the same island, the environments are consistent in their sense of style. 
That's not to say that everything looks the same, but it all still feels as if it belongs in the same game. As usual, when it comes to the soundtrack, Gust knows how to deliver. The music was composed by Hayato Asano, Kazuki Yanagawa, and Daisuke Achiwa, who have all worked on several other Gust titles in the past, mixing together soft piano tracks for the more emotional scenes between the girls but still bringing it hard for the bosses is just what I would expect from Gust. It's a perfect balance reflecting both the dread of the incoming sacrifice as well as the anger that they carry towards their fate. No track overpowers the others, but they all have their own rightful place in the game. So yeah, I undeniably did find it fun to play. I thoroughly enjoyed the visual design, themes, and the music, so one might think that I would have no problem with the game. Well, I mean, it's about a half-human, half-demon trying to save the world from eternal night by defeating demons and gathering up their blood using her demon sword and her demon summons. And then she uses the blood to power herself up. It's cool. It's really cool. I cannot stress that enough, but unfortunately, I think the game suffers from some tone and focus issues. There's a scene that takes place after you finish the first chapter, in which you're taken away to a strange, dreamlike location. Immediately, the area doesn't look like you're in the real world anymore. The music is melancholic and different from anything that you've heard so far. As Ari wakes up, she's dazed and confused, only to be greeted by a weird entity that calls itself the Guardian of the Demon Sword and takes the form of Lily. The Guardian then goes on to explain just how you can utilize the blood that you collect in order to power yourself up through different means. It's clearly a mystical and rather serious scene. That is, until the Guardian tells Ari that she'll need to change into the proper attire for the ritual and puts her in this ridiculous white cloak that has a boob window which just made me laugh and completely killed off the mysterious feeling that the scene had. Listening to her explanation as to why this white cloak with a matching bikini was the most fitting outfit for a blood sacrificing ritual was like listening to Kojima explain why Quiet can't wear clothes or she'll die all over again. I don't consider myself a stick in the mud. I don't hate all fan service, and I don't even have a problem with most of it. If a game is fully aware and prides itself on having pretty characters, and as long as it's not presented in a potentially harmful light, I say have fun with it. I do, however, have a problem with fan service when it completely destroys the tone of a scene to the point of no recovery. Little did I know that this was the first sign of a problem that was going to become a lot more evident down the line. The truth is that Knights of Azure just feels like it doesn't have enough confidence in itself to tell a compelling story. That, alongside the fact that Lily feels incredibly distant, during any part of the game that's not the interlude parts. For some reason, Lily starts working as a maid at the hotel while you're out fighting off demons. I mean, I know exactly why, and it's because they wanted to put her in a maid outfit, but I'm saying it doesn't make much sense within the narrative. There's little time for you to be considering Lily when you're out in the field because she feels so disconnected from everything that you do outside. The supporting cast just come off as incredibly bland. Not once was I really interested in either Lloyd or Alucard, and I just found their bickering cliché in a waste of time. I would much rather have had more scenes between Ari and Lily exploring their past. This is what I mean by the fact that I wish the game believed more in itself and allowed itself to be more dramatic. Entire subplots are mentioned, such as countries using the blue blood to turn soldiers into demons. That's really interesting and it tells us a lot about the state that the world is in, but the game doesn't bother doing much with it except just briefly mentioning it. The game even throws in a bunch of smart advice, which I think goes to show that it has sound writing. It just lacks a certain focus and depth. So, although I was feeling rather unsatisfied after the first entry, I still had another hope, namely the 2017 sequel, Knights of Azure 2, Bride of the New Moon. The second entry features a similar scenario. Our holy knight Alush, Al Alush, Alush, <laughs> otherwise nicknamed Aru, is tasked with protecting the saint Liliana, who is to be sacrificed in order to ward off the evil powers of a being known as the Moon Queen 
on orders of the Curia. Much like our knight and saint from the first game, Ade and Liliana have a past as well. They grew up in the same city when they were young and attended the same school together, with another girl named Ruinheid, who betrayed the Curia and joined an opposing organization known as the Lourdes Order. As Ade is escorting Liliana, they run into Ruinheid, who tells them to leave the Curia and join her instead, insisting that there must be another way to get rid of the Eternal Knight without sacrificing Liliana. Their discussion is cut short, however, as they're attacked by the Moon Queen. Although they manage to fight her off for a bit, Aru is eventually stabbed by the Moon Queen's blade and passes out as a result. When she wakes up, she finds out that she's been saved by a curious scientist named Camilla, who performed a blood transfusion using blue blood, which turned Aru into a half-demon and gave her her new red hair. This is what allows her to summon both a demon sword and command servants in combat, which is not only a callback to the first game, but also a good way for the game to weave in the new combat functions by bringing back what's already familiar. Light and heavy attacks are still tied to square and triangle, but you're more encouraged to use combos. L2 and R2 are reserved for different servants, and while you still have your dodge, you now also have the ability to guard. One of the biggest differences between the first and the second game is the inclusion of partners, or lilies. Depending on the person that you partner up with, you will have different supporting skills and combo skills that you can use together. Working together in combat, as well as completing certain side quests surrounding each character, will raise your affection level with that character. They somehow managed to make it not feel cluttered with too many abilities due to the basic combat system still remaining very simple. I was never stumped by all of the new options I had, but I found that it flowed together very well. Right off the bat, Knights of Azure 2 has a much stronger opening than the first game. It does have the advantage due to the fact that it doesn't need to elaborate on any of the terms that were brought up in the first game, as it's safe to assume that most players know about them. But the very first playable segment of the game was what made me realize that they had stepped their game up. Mere minutes after meeting Liliana, Aru tells her to stand back so she won't be attacked by monsters. Liliana, however, steps up, acknowledging the fact that she is a member of the Curia too, and that it is a part of her job to defeat the monsters as well. And so, the two of you fight side by side, already making the saint feel more involved in the situation and the events that are happening. Aru fighting together with party members offers a certain spark that the first entry was missing. Fighting feels more grand now. Teaming up with your party members and shooting demons out of the sky is more engaging and interesting than button mashing to make your demon puppy bite something. As cute as some of the servants are, they don't feel like party members as much as they feel like pets. And the sequel undeniably fixes that by not only giving us an interesting cast, but also a group of party members with varied fighting styles and skill sets. As for the visuals and ambience, I think most of you are probably able to tell that it's an obvious upgrade. The character designs are even more over the top, and the environments look better. They're really banking on the aesthetic harder in this entry, and it's only for the better. And the same composers return once more, and somehow manage to make an even better soundtrack for the sequel, that has even more bombastic tracks. It feels like an extension of the first game soundtrack, but powered up. It's more majestic. So with even more amazing music, a bigger, more interesting cast, improved visuals, improved combat, and no stupid ritual outfits. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the weird tone problem is still present. Similarly to the first game, there is another scene which takes place in the first chapter which just completely shoots itself in the foot. Ruinheid and Aru have a very serious conversation concerning the fact that Aru has become half-demon. Aru is worried that Liliana might be afraid of her now, but Duenheit reassures her that she will always be herself, regardless of the blue blood that's now coursing through her veins. It's very touching, on paper. But the scene plays out in the pool area of the hotel that they're staying at, while something that sounds like 
ambient jazz music from The Sims is playing? And why is Drenheide wearing heels in the pool? This kind of thing happens more than once. As if the game doesn't think that its players can stay focused if they don't show us some bikini shots every once in a while. It feels like the equivalent of dangling a pair of keys in front of a baby to make sure they don't lose interest as we go through some character exposition. Scenes like these were spread throughout, and although they weren't that frequent, I still found myself laughing when it happened. Which is a treat in one sense, but it's not exactly helping you take the game seriously. At the end of the day, I'm sure a lot of people are going to write all of that off by saying, well, what did you expect? And I won't say that I wasn't expecting any fan service. Gust is a company that prides itself on having very cute girls in their video games. And this is a series about pretty demon girls who suck each other's blood. The UD imagery both in-game and in the promotional art is the most heavy-handed thing I've ever seen. And like I said earlier, it's not that I have a problem with fan service in itself, but when it ruins a scene that could otherwise be very good by making me laugh, I can't help but to feel disappointed afterwards. I don't want to sit by the pool and have a mimosa while a character is discussing the fear of losing her humanity. The game doesn't fully have the confidence to go as hard on the story as it could. The reason I didn't split these two games up into two separate reviews is because I think two just does what the original did, but better. They're also quite short games, so I decided to go ahead and talk about them together. And even though I've been a bit hard on them, I don't hate Knights of Azure. I did find both games enjoyable to play, and I like a lot of the concepts. It's because I was enjoying them that I expected more. I want the games to feel more confident in building on the basis of their story and world. Although, I also know for a fact that that's not the main appeal of these games. Which leaves me feeling a bit bittersweet. Although they're not the longest of games, I would advise doing what I did and buy the games on sale if you happen to pass by them, because they're fun. If you want to kill a couple hours with some demon girls and some amazing music, I would recommend you check the games out. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching.